Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. Before we go anywhere near an airplane, we need to talk about Leroy Grumman. There are times when it's easy to forget that there is sometimes a person behind the name of a company. Grumman may seem to be a company name, like Airbus is a company name, but not in this case. Grumman was a man, and he was deeply and intimately tied to the company that bears his name. You've heard me say many times on this podcast that so-and-so was bitten by the aviation bug. For Leroy Grumman, it seems like he was born with the bug as some sort of birth condition in 1895, and he carried it as a chronic condition all the way through his life until his passing in 1982. He was already interested in aviation during his early schooling, and by the time he was graduating in 1911, he said this during his high school salutatory address. Open quotes. The final perfection of the aeroplane will be one of the greatest triumphs that man has ever gained over nature. Close quotes. By 1916, he had earned a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell, during World War I, he joined the U.S. Naval Reserve, applied for pilot training, and just imagine how devastated Leroy was when he was rejected due to his flat feet. He was assigned to an aircraft inspection course, but when he arrived there, he realized that pilot trainees were being trained at the same location. So he just walked into the wrong course, the one that he wanted, and ended up being commissioned as U.S. Naval Aviator number 1216. He became a flight instructor, flew in a bombing squadron, was sent to MIT to study aeronautical engineering, and then became a test pilot for both Curtis and Navy built flying boats. In 1919, Leroy resigned his naval commission when he was offered a job with the Loning Aeronautical Engineering Corporation in New York City which I had never heard of until this very moment. They built flying boats for the U.S. Navy. He worked his way rapidly up the ranks of the company all the way up to general manager when in 1929 disaster struck in the form of the beginning of the Great Depression, when Loning decided to close up shop. But Leroy must have been one of those disaster is actually an opportunity people because he mortgaged his house for 17000 and with a couple of other colleagues from Loning and two other investors, formed their own company. They took over a former auto showroom and garage, hired 13 more employees, and formed the Grumman Corporation. In the beginning, they would do just about anything to keep the order sheet filled. They bought up all of Loning's spare parts, and so took contracts to fix Navy flying boats. They built aluminum floats for other aircraft, and when there were no aviation orders, they weren't picky. They would build aluminum truck bodies if they needed, just to keep the lights on. But what the Grumman company really wanted was contracts for naval aircraft. And so Leroy was always looking for an edge. He found it when he heard of the Navy's desire for aircraft with retractable landing gear. Leroy already had been working on the idea back at Loning for their air yacht idea, so he completed the design, and got the patent for retractable landing gear for airplanes in 1932. The retractable gear, which was hand-cranked, by the way, made it into Grumman's first complete aircraft design for the U.S. Navy, the FF-1. It's interesting that some of the products of aircraft companies really do have family resemblance characteristics. You may not know what an FF-1 looks like, but you probably know what the Wildcat will eventually look like. Take the Wildcat, regress it back into a biplane with struts and wires, and that's pretty much the look. In summer 1933, FF-1s began equipping fighter squadron FB-5B of the USS Lexington, where it got its nickname as the Fifi. The Fifi was a great success, with some 55 built under license in Canada for the RCAF, and some examples being sold to Spain, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Japan. It actually saw combat in the Spanish Civil War. Although outclassed by this time, one example did get one kill, 
a Henkel HE-59B flying boat. Are you beginning to wonder, dear listener, if we're ever going to get to the story of the Wildcat? Well, yes, but you will still have to be patient. Because unlike some aircraft designs, which seem to leap from imagination to drawing board to factory to the air, the Wildcat kind of evolved in an almost biological fashion. The two-seat FF-1 evolved into the single-seat F-2F-1, which, honestly, looks quite similar to its predecessor, although perhaps a bit aerodynamically cleaner and with a stronger Twin Wasp Jr. radial engine, it was able to fly 22 miles per hour faster. 55 were ordered, and this would also start the pattern of Grumman's aircraft having the F, insert number, F, designations that would continue on into the future. The Navy had a few complaints about the F-2F, namely poor stability and spin recovery characteristics, so the next evolution began. The same Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp Jr. engine was retained, but behind it, the fuselage was lengthened and the area of the wings increased. Having smaller wheel diameters eliminated the landing gear bulge behind the cowling of the F2F, allowing for greater fuselage streamlining. The new aircraft was known as the F3F, although the Navy's test program for the F3F was pretty rough, with one prototype breaking up in flight, killing the test pilot, and another requiring a bailout after an unsuccessful spin recovery, 147 were eventually built and entered service. All right, so you're starting to see a pattern here with these evolutions, but I promise that the pattern will soon be broken. And how do you know that something is going to change? It is because I finally get to say, design and development. So, the next Grumman naval fighter, XF-4F, was to be the same type of slow evolution from the earlier biplane model. But just like out in the real world, evolution sometimes has to deal with rapid environmental change. So did Grumman and the XF-4F. The environmental change that occurred was that the era of biplane fighters was over. And it became obvious to all that the Grumman biplane offering was going to lose out to Brewster's F-2A1. So in 1935, Grumman's team slammed the brakes on the XF-4F biplane, renamed it the XF-4F1 to get it out of the way, and started working right away on the XF4F2 monoplane. In the competition against the Brewster Buffalo, the prototype XF4F2 was a little faster, but the Buffalo won out on maneuverability. The Buffalo won the competition. So Leroy Grumman and his team gave up and went home. Of course they didn't. They started working right away on another version, and that brings us to... Prototypes. Their third attempt, known appropriately as the XF4F3, firstly got new wings, with a span increasing from 34 to 38 feet, and these were given the distinctive square tips. It also got a new tail. But the most important addition was a stronger, supercharged version of the Pratt & Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp radial engine. First flying on the 12th of February 1939, the prototype XF4F3 achieved an impressive top speed of 335 miles per hour at 21,000 feet. Natural selection had finally done its job, and Grumman seemed to have a winner. Orders began arriving, but perhaps surprisingly, not from the U.S. Navy just yet. Operational History and Further Evolutions Already at war, France and Britain's Anglo-French Purchasing Board was on a shopping spree for aircraft. France placed some orders, but the country fell before they could be delivered, and these aircraft ended up going to the British Royal Navy. They named their F-4Fs the Martlet, which is a bird. However, I literally just learned that it is not a real bird at all, but a mythical bird used in English heraldry. It is said to be hatched without feet so that it can never stop flying and will not land or roost until its death. 
They are supposed to be symbols for continuous effort. I see this as fitting in a couple of ways. Firstly, the martlet is the symbol for my alma mater, McGill University, and it took some continuous effort to get me through that. But perhaps even more for the purpose of our story, the F4F, whatever the name, would be continuously produced and would continuously fight without rest right up until the end of the war. The Brits were happy to get the martlet as a replacement for their older two-seat fairy fulmers, which just couldn't compete against the more modern single-seat fighters. Also, British-made navalized Spitfires were going to be slow in coming as every single land-based machine was needed for the RAF like yesterday. The first Martlets did not have folding wings, but they were armed with four 50 caliber Browning machine guns with 450 rounds per gun. The Brits liked their Martlets, with Eric Winkle Brown, the British test pilot who flew just about everything, stating, open quotes, I would still assess the aircraft as the outstanding naval fighter of the early years of World War II. I can vouch as a matter of personal experience, this Grumman fighter was one of the finest shipboard aeroplanes ever created. Close quotes. On Christmas Day, 1940, a land-based martlet gave an early Christmas present to the fleet air arm by shooting down a Junkers Ju-88 bomber over Scapa Flow Naval Base, which was the first combat victory by a U.S.-built fighter in British service in World War II. The Brits used their martlets in a new way by placing six of them on a former German merchant ship that had been converted into what became known as an escort aircraft carrier. This vessel, HMS Audacity, definitely showed the characteristic of Audacity when, in September 1941, its martlets shot down multiple Luftwaffe FW-200 Condors during highly effective convoy escorts. In 1941, the next evolution occurred with the release of the F4F-4. This one featured another Leroy Grumman invented and patented product, the Stow Wing Folding System, which folds the wings back and along the fuselage, rather than hinging them somewhere along the wing and folding the tips together up above the aircraft. This feature instantly allowed double the number of aircraft to be stored on board an aircraft carrier. The Dash 4 also had two extra 50 cals, although fewer rounds with only about 20 seconds of firing time total. This version also had plumbing to carry droppable auxiliary fuel tanks, either two 58-gallon tanks or a single 42-gallon tank. The new fighter was known in the U.S. as the Wildcat, and the Royal Navy adopted that name also. The new fighter had put on weight with the new guns and mods, and so a final version known as the FM-2 was introduced. It was put on a diet and so was 450 pounds lighter and also had a more powerful 1,350 horsepower engine with single-stage two-speed supercharger, and some had water injection. Speed and rate of climb were improved, and the type was more versatile to boot, having increased internal fuel capacity, wing racks, and zero-length rails, allowing it to carry a 250-pound bomb or 5-inch rockets under each wing. Nearly 1,200 martlets and wildcats were flown by the British, and they did great service in the Atlantic, helping to win the battle against the U-boats. About 27 U-boats were destroyed, either directly by F-4Fs or with their aid. If they didn't sink the U-boats on their own, they would use their hail of fire from their 650s to suppress the U-boats' own AA guns so that other bombing aircraft could do the job. The Wildcats' weaknesses were not really seen in the Atlantic because they did not usually have to dogfight against other enemy fighters. However, in March 1945, Wildcats shot down four Messerschmitt BF-109s over Norway, and these were the Fleet Air Arms' last victories by Wildcats of the war. Meanwhile, back in the States, at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, 
the U.S. Navy only had one fully equipped Wildcat squadron, this being VF-6 on Enterprise. There were some Wildcats at Ewa, Marine Air Corps Station on Oahu, and nine of these were damaged or destroyed during the attack. On Wake Island the next day, seven Wildcats were lost, but another five fought hard and achieved a first bomber kill on the 9th of December, and they sank a destroyer, and the Japanese invasion force was obliged to retreat. Although the Wildcats' sturdy construction, armor, and self-sealing fuel tanks could aid in its survival, it was outclassed by its main Pacific rival, the Mitsubishi Zero, which was faster, more maneuverable, and had longer range. In his Midway After Action report, James Jimmy Thatch wrote, open quotes, It is indeed surprising that any of our pilots returned alive. Any success our fighter pilots may have had against the Japanese Zero fighter is not due to the performance of the airplane we fly, but is the result of the comparatively poor marksmanship of the Japanese, stupid mistakes made by a few of their pilots, and superior marksmanship and teamwork of some of our pilots. The F-4F airplane is pitifully inferior in climb, maneuverability, and speed. Close quotes. If the U.S. was able to use certain advantages, such as early warnings by coastal watchers or radar, then the Wildcats would be able to get up high and dive in for hit-and-run attacks. This would negate their disadvantages. If they didn't have these advantages and had to tangle directly with the Zeros, then they were at a serious deficit. Even though inferior as dogfighters, as stated before, the ruggedness of the Wildcat became legendary, even to the Japanese pilots. Zero ace Saburo Sakai wrote, open quotes, I had full confidence in my ability to destroy the Grumman and decided to finish off the enemy fighter with only my 7.7mm machine guns. I turned the 20mm cannon switch to the off position and then closed in. For some strange reason, even after I had poured about five or 600 rounds of ammunition directly into the Grumman, the airplane did not fall, but kept on flying. I thought this is very odd. It had never happened before and closed the distance between the two airplanes until I could almost reach out and touch the Grumman. To my surprise, the Grumman's rudder and tail were torn to shreds, looking like an old, torn piece of rag. With his plane in such condition, no wonder the pilot was unable to continue fighting. A Zero which had taken that many bullets would have been a ball of fire by now. Close quotes. U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps Wildcats played major roles in the defense of Wake Island, the Battle of Coral Sea, the Battle of Midway, and the Guadalcanal Campaign. However, it was obvious that something more was needed, and the lessons from the Pacific Air Battles were being fed back to Grumman for another evolution. This one would be significant enough to get a whole new cat name, but for that... We'll have to wait for the next episode. Production Unlike many World War II aircraft that were replaced by another company product during the conflict, the Wildcat was not cancelled, but continued to be produced right up until the end of the war. True, the Grumman Company stopped building them themselves in 1943 to focus on the Wildcat's new sister, the Hellcat, But General Motors kept on churning them out until an incredible total of 7,885 had been built for the Fleet Air Arm, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, and the Royal Canadian Navy. Pilots Edward Henry Butch O'Hare has quite the story. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and his dad was a lawyer who had worked closely with none other than Al Capone, the famous gangster. At some point, Butch's father turned on Capone and had provided incriminating evidence which helped put Capone away for tax evasion. For this, the elder O'Hare would be gunned down by Capone's goons in 1939. 
But back in 1933, Butch entered the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, and in 1939, he began his flight training. Upon completing his training, in May 1940, he was assigned to Fighter Squadron 3, VF-3, on board USS Saratoga. He trained on the Grumman F-3F and Brewster F-2A Buffalo. He was soon known as having exceptional flying abilities as well as gunnery excellence. He was also pretty good with the ladies, or at least one lady. On Monday, July 21st, he made his first flight in our featured aircraft, the F-4F, and in a series of hops ended up in St. Louis the next day. While visiting the wife of a friend in the hospital, O'Hare met nurse Rita Wooster and proposed to her on the spot, which was the very first time that they had ever met. Three months later, they were married and on their honeymoon in Hawaii, although they had traveled there in separate ships, he on the Saratoga and she on the liner Lurline. On January 11, 1942, Saratoga was hit by a Japanese torpedo and was sent for extensive repairs on the West Coast. So O'Hare's squadron was transferred to the USS Lexington, and it was from this ship that he made his most famous flight. At 10.15 on February 20th, 1942, Lexington was 450 miles from the harbor at Rabaul when radar contacts were picked up 35 miles from the ship. Six wildcats were scrambled. Although there were three contacts, and so the group was split into three groups of two, one pair found and splashed a big Japanese Mavis flying boat. The second pair also ran into and splashed another Mavis. The third contact was not found. Later, at 1625, the Wildcats were scrambled again, this time to deal with nine Japanese Mitsubishi G4M Betty bombers. The majority of the formation went after the Bettys, with O'Hare and his wingman, Marion Duff DeFilo, being held back as a reserve. It was lucky that they were, because very soon another formation was spotted. O'Hare and DeFilo headed for the attack. Unluckily, though, DeFilo soon was to be disappointed when his guns jammed. That left just O'Hare. O'Hare dove in first from the formation's right side, and using a quick deflection shot, knocked out a Betty's engine. He then switched his aim to another Betty, shot, and set it afire. Although neither were knocked out, both Bettys dropped out of formation and O'Hare turned to attack again, this time from the left side. He hit a third Betty, causing it to dump bombs and run. His fourth shot knocked down that Betty for a definite kill. Swooping in again from the left side, time was getting short. The Bettys were arriving at their bomb release points. He shot down another Betty and then hit the lead plane's engine, ripping off the entire nacelle, causing it and the plane to drop away. During this last attack, O'Hare realized he was out of ammo. The surviving Bettys dropped their bombs towards Lexington, but because of O'Hare's harassment, all the bombs missed. One badly damaged Betty tried a kamikaze attack, but also missed the ship. Captain Frederick C. Sherman, commander of the Lexington, was convinced that O'Hare's actions had saved the ship. And O'Hare was selected as the very first naval aviator to receive the Medal of Honor. At a ceremony with President Franklin D. Roosevelt, O'Hare's wife Rita placed the medal around Butch's neck. On the night of November 26, 1943, O'Hare participated in one of the first night fighter operations from carrier USS Enterprise where Hellcats and Avengers were used together to intercept Japanese bombers. He was again going after a Betty when O'Hare's Hellcat was caught in crossfire between the Betty and the Avenger. O'Hare's Hellcat dropped out and disappeared. There has been controversy over who actually killed O'Hare but the most recent evidence seems to point in favor that O'Hare was not killed by the Avengers' fire, but that this Betty had finally gotten revenge for her sisters. Even after expansive searching, nothing was ever found of Butch or his aircraft. 
survivors. The F4F is well represented in static and airworthy examples in both the UK and USA, and more are under restoration as we speak. So, Warbirders, keep looking in the next couple weeks for our next episode where we will be looking at another cat, the Hellcat. Thanks to all who support the podcast through Patreon or PayPal. I appreciate it more than you can know. You can also check out photos of what we've been talking about on the Patreon page. These are available to all for free. Until next time.